with that, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Mohammed Ahmed. Um, he, as I mentioned, received the Human Rights Award in 2007 um, for the work that he was doing in Darfur. He was the medical director of the Amel Center, and his work was really focused on protect, protecting survivors of um, violence and advocating for peace and justice and reconciliation in Darfur. In addition um, to the work he does as a medical doctor and as a leader um, within civil society, within the NGO community, he's also a respected elder of the Fur tribe and has been involved in many of the negotiations over the years when conflicts have arisen uh, in Darfur. Unfortunately, um, a few years ago, Dr. Mohammed um, was forced to seek asylum in the United States because it was no longer safe for him to be there and to continue his work here. Um, but as you will hear from him today, he is working um, just as hard, if not harder, from here to um, bring peace and accountability to, um, to Darfur. Dr. Mohammed? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm really uh, grateful to be here today and to see the enthusiasm of contributing to solve the problem of that work. Now, when I came here in 2007, privilege to see the Robert Kennedy's Human Rights Award in 2007, the accountability and human civilian protection were top priorities. And with my commitment to the accountability and peace in that forum, I thought that I need to do more harm to bring this as a, as a fact in the ground. So after the ceremony, I went back to that forum and I worked with community leaders, tribal leaders, and different community groups to bring this issue at the hot part of it because there's no con reconciliation without the participation of civil society. And the civil society had to work very hard to lead the work. So through that commitment, we reached to uh, agreeable uh, common goals with the, with the civil society and the community leaders, but unfortunately, as uh, Monica said, there was no time to, to finish that work. And I believe that we have to continue since we believe that people are always right. When we came here in the United States for the second time, we decided to continue our research work to put a clear message for the people of Darfur about how they can reach to that point of peace and accountability. And with the help of our friends and brothers and activists in different parts, but specifically with collaboration with uh, California University, Professor Diane and Davis Law School were able to finish and reach this paper, which I think I'm really proud to see now. This is a work which puts the experience of other countries who underwent transition justice. And for us as a forest, we want people to know What's the transition justice? How can we reach that stage? And to reach that stage, it needs a hard work. This is the beginning, because this is a work, this is a research, this is a, the science, scientific background for us to start now. And this is a work which we need that the Darfuri diaspora and the civil society in the ground should take <coughs> a great role in that. How can that be? I think people of Darfur through our leading organization like uh, Darfur Lawyers Network, refugees, communities, so groups, 
displaced persons groups who are they are organized in their groups and they know what's, what's, what they need to do. And other non-governmental organizations in the ground, like the youth group, the women group, <coughs> and the students group, they are working tirelessly to make this a reality. So I'm sure that they will be definitely happy to hear that there is a work and this is a good start, scientific uh, background to start from it. What we want to, to do is the people of Darfur with their different ethnic and community groups to be deeply engaged to disseminate this information, make it a reality, decide what type of transition justice mechanism they want, and then put it to the decision makers. Who are these decision makers? For us are the Sudan government, the United Nations, and the African Union. These are the ones to whom our final product should go and tell them, please, these are our recommendations for type of transition justice what we want, and we want to implement it as a, as a way of peace and reconciliation. <coughs> I think this is now for us is the beginning of the work. And I am sure that we have different mechanisms for that. We have the diaspora here. We have diaspora groups and, uh, who are organized in their um, corporates and different uh, unity groups. Others in, in Australia and other uh, European countries. And they are working tirelessly with us to reach that goal of peace in that form. So I think we want to know, we will do to reach that goal. And that will be through a hard work with these sections in the ground, and not just a matter of um, paper written and that. No, we want to make it a reality. And that's a hard work for the, my colleagues here in the United States, in Europe, in Australia, and other parts, and basically our leading groups in, in that for lawyers, elites, and other civil society groups to be deeply engaged to disseminate the information. What is the legal part of it? Because the lawyers are the one who can decide what are the terminologies of this book, of this research. And they can explain it to the other uh, colleague. And then at the end of the day, they will decide, OK, that is our choice and what type of peace we want. Uh, I know, I'm sure that, yes, there are, uh, we know there are other media we, which we can utilize to disseminate the information. We have the Radio Devanga and other media which can disseminate that information in uh, local, simple Arabic and local language. And I hope that by then we will tell you that this is our product. And thank you for the American people who supported us to read that book. Thank you, everybody.